My name is Mark Kamienkowski. I'm a professor of physics and astronomy at Johns Hopkins University. We're talking about cosmic microwave background. Three words. What do those three words mean? What is that? So cosmic uh, doesn't mean like, wow, that's really cosmic. It uh, refers to things that are um, outside of Earth. And in this context, cosmic actually refers to the universe on the very largest scales. We're not talking about the solar system here. We're not talking about the galaxy. We're not even talking about our local group of galaxies. We are talking about the universe as a whole. Microwave refers to the electromagnetic frequency or the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation that we're observing. Um, you probably have heard of microwave from microwave ovens. Those are frequencies of about a billion hertz. Um, usually the observations we do are in the range of uh, 30 to a few hundred hertz. Um, and background refers to um, what we see on the sky. So when you look at the sky with your eyes, what you see are a whole bunch of stars, little points of light. But in between those little points of light is just black, just darkness. If you were to look at the sky um, with eyes that operate at microwave frequencies, you wouldn't see stars and darkness behind it. The entire sky would glow. That's why we call it a background. What's the point of looking at that? Oh, what's the point of looking at the cosmic microwave background? Um, the point of looking at the cosmic microwave background is that uh, we're seeing the universe when we look at this light as it was 380,000 years after the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. So it's actually the most direct signal that we have from the earliest universe. When we look at uh, the most distant galaxies, we're seeing the universe as it was, say, a billion years after the Big Bang. When we look at the cosmic microwave background, we're seeing it uh, really in its infancy, even before its infancy. So one way to say it is that, you know, if we are talking and we're, you know, less than 100 years old, 10 to 100 years old, uh, the universe today is 14 billion years old. When we look at the cosmic microwave background, it was 380,000 years old. We're looking at the universe um, as if we were looking at a human being um, right after a conception occurred during the very first stages of cell division. So we're really looking at the, not the infant universe, we're looking at what happened even before the infant universe. What can you hope to understand about the nature of the world by looking that far away that, and, and that far back in time? So what's interesting about the universe is it actually turns out to be a very simple physical system. And the most striking feature of the cosmic microwave background is it happens to look very, very much the same everywhere we look in the sky. We look over there in the sky, and the cosmic microwave background looks more or less like it does over there. It's a one part in 100,000. What's interesting, though, is that when we do look to, at intensity variations or brightness variations of less than one part in 100,000, we do see variations. And what we're seeing are the tiny seeds that later via gravitational infall gave rise to things like galaxies and clusters of galaxies. So we're really seeing the, the, the seeds from which everything that we see in the universe today grew. What are the questions that you can try to answer by looking at that? Because we get this concept that you're looking a very long way away. We can get this concept that you're looking at patchiness and that patchiness turns into some of the structures that we see now. Okay. So what are the questions that you're trying to get at? What are the possibilities, the, the problems that you're trying to get at when it comes to that? So it's kind of cool to look at a universe which has a, a tremendous amount of structure, stars, galaxies, um, structures on larger scales, very complicated objects, and then understand that it grew from a relatively simple, relatively smooth initial universe. But what's even more interesting than that to me is that we actually have this theory um, it's not really clear exactly how it came about because it's kind of uh, came out of nowhere. We have this theory for how the Big Bang um, got going, what set the universe uh, expanding in the first place. And that theory or hypothesis or class of theories is called inflation. Um, it's a very interesting idea and it sort of answers the question of how the Big Bang got set in motion. And this involves physics not 380,000 years after the Big Bang, not a second after the Big Bang, not a microsecond after the Big Bang, but a tiny nano, 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 nanosecond after the Big Bang. And we're talking about the universe when it was extremely new. And we're talking about um, densities 
where the energies of the particles whizzing around were many orders of magnitude higher than the energies of particles that we can, that we can accelerate in laboratories like CERN. So there's this uh, synergy or uh, bringing together of the structure of the very largest scale of the universe and the physics of the very smallest scales. And it's kind of interesting that you can think about uh, what was going on in the universe a nano, 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 nanosecond after the Big Bang. What kind of things were going on there? And what kind of things could, do we already know? And what do, sort of questions are hanging around? <coughs> so we really don't know anything about it, which makes it kind of interesting. If we already knew, then it wouldn't be any big deal. You know, if I take something out of my pocket, you know, and, and drop it on the ground, I can actually write down the laws of physics that explain how something I drop falls. And that's great, and that's wonderful, but who really cares? It's kind of boring. Um, with the Big Bang, we can't do that. We don't really know what set it in motion. As I said, there's this idea called inflation, but it's not really a theory. It's a class of ideas. It's a paradigm. Um, so some of the ideas for what drove inflation are quantum gravity, how it is the quantum mechanics gets merged with, uh, with um, Einstein's general relativity. There are things like, ran like Randy unification. We have theories that describe the strong, weak, and electromagnetic interactions that work very well. There are very, very intriguing ideas about how those three forces get unified at some ultra high energy scale called grain unification. There's no way we could ever probe grain unification directly in a laboratory experiment. The accelerator that would be required would be much greater than the size of the solar system. So here we have a chance to, to actually look to see what's going on at ultra high energies, learn about grain unification, learn about the, the merger of quantum mechanics and gravity. Maybe there are extra dimensions. We really don't know. So it's sort of a laboratory for exploring a number of very intriguing um, ideas about new physics. Um, what do you think about the Planck mission? Oh, the Planck mission is a very exciting project. Um, it's actually quite spectacular. And I'm a theorist. So anytime anybody's actually measure anything, it, I'm pretty impressed. And that they can do this is absolutely remarkable to me. Um, the Planck project uh, is going to follow on the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe, which is one of the most important science projects in history. And Planck is going to do what uh, WMAP, the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe, did um, with far greater precision, um, with many more capabilities. So there are a number of questions that WMAP still leaves um, unanswered that Planck should hopefully do better with. Um, it'll be able to determine the um, the abundance of the various constituents of matter in the universe better, how much atomic matter there is, how much dark energy there is, um, how much dark matter there is, how many neutrinos there are. Um, it should tell us more about the physics responsible for inflation. It'll give us a lot more information, a lot more things that we can look at, a lot more handles to discriminate between things like quantum gravity and grain unification, and extra dimensions. Um, and then there are other things that it can do for the late time universe. So. What I've been talking about so far is looking at the very earliest seconds after the nano, 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 nano seconds after the Big Bang. But Planck will also see a lot of interesting things in later universes. We'll learn a huge amount about galaxy clusters. Uh, we'll learn about um, the distribution of mass in the late universe through th an effect called weak gravitational lensing. So it's a very, very rich experiment. There are many things that we can look for in, uh, in the Planck data and the I'm looking forward to seeing it. Let's have a little quick talk again about cosmic microwave background because that's the thing that you're an expert in amongst other things. Um, it's a, it, it, is that the only way? Is that our only shot at having a look at that, that moment after the Big Bang? Is that the only way we can do it? The cosmic microwave background is not the only way to study inflation. It's not the only way, it's not the only consequence that we can look at. But right now, I think it's far and away our best probe. There are other things that people are doing in the world of cosmology. Um, there are galaxy surveys that measure the distribution of mass over very large scales. And um, galaxy surveys are very much a growth industry. Um, the surveys that people were doing 10 years ago now are almost quaint. Um, and in the next 10 years, there are going to be a number of uh, new missions to measure the distribution of mass over the largest scales, including um, the European Space Agency's Euclid mission. Um, in the far future, um, we hope to be able to d measure the distribution of mass um, in, the, in the 
through a, over larger volumes of the universe through something called 21 centimeter intensity mapping. And that's very promising and very exciting, but some way off in the future. Um, right now, the cosmic microwave background, the Planck satellite, I think uh, are really at leading the game in terms of providing very precise information about the early universe. The other advantage of the Planck satellite and the cosmic microwave background is, as I said, when we look at the cosmic microwave background, we're looking at the universe as it was 380,000 years after the Big Bang. When we look at galaxy surveys, we're looking at the universe as it was 10 billion years after the Big Bang. And you know, when you try to piece together what happened at a crime scene, it's best to get all the data as quickly, you know, soon afterwards. With time, things disappear, people's memories uh, start to go. So with the cosmic microwave background, if you want to study the very earliest universe, the cosmic microwave background provides your, very early, your, your closest probe to what happened at the Big Bang. Where do you want to be 10 years from now? I'm not saying professionally, I'm saying scientifically. Where, where do we want to be? Are, are we going to be at a point where we're, we're going to have a big leap forward in terms of our understanding of, of, of the early universe? So it's... Physicists, theoretical physicists are supposed to make predictions about experiments. Theoretical physicists are notoriously bad at making predictions about what's actually going to happen historically in the future. Um, there are a number of things I'd be very interested to see within the next 10 years. I think within the next 10 years, there's a good chance that we'll see um, a signature in the polarization of the cosmic microwave background of gravitational waves from inflation. So inflation makes a number of predictions. One of the predictions it makes is that the universe should be filled with a gas of gravitational waves. So the universe is filled with a gas of electromagnetic waves, which are the cosmic microwave background that we see today. But inflation also predicts that it should be a gas of gravitational waves. So an electromagnetic wave is a, fluctu or a propagating disturbance in an electromagnetic wave, electric field. Um, in gravity, there are gravitational fields. The gravitational field of the sun is what holds us holds the, the, the solar system together. Um, but Einstein's theory of general relativity predicts that there should be propagating disturbances in the gravitational field analogous to electromagnetic waves, which are propagating disturb disturbances in the electromagnetic fields. And those gravitational waves leave a signature in the polarization of the cosmic microwave background. And this so-called B mode, or curl component of the cosmic microwave background polarization has sort of become a holy grail of cosmology. Um, and the idea is that if we can detect it, then we can learn about the density of the universe at the time that inflation happened. And if we can learn that, then we might be able to learn whether uh, inflation had something to do with grain unification, or with string theory, or some lower energy, new physics um, beyond that. So I'd be very interested to see uh, that signature of inflation in the cosmic microwave background polarization. Why do you do this? Why do you bother? It's a difficult thing to do. What's getting you out of bed and getting you motivated on this? Um, I think a lot of people look at cosmologists and think that they were born interested in the big questions. Um, and these are really big questions and they are very interesting. Um, but when you work in the field, when you work on the subject day to day, you're just doing calculations. And the thing that I really enjoy about the whole process is having a well-defined physical problem that I don't know the answer to, trying to do, come up with some hypothesis, sit down with pencil and paper, try to make a prediction, and then see if that prediction turns out to be true.